now that we've seen what is on offer in lightwave's rendering engine, which is basically boiling down to the fact that it is a physically based rendering engine with, of course, you know, the cell shade capability as well. We're going to move on and take a look at some of the aspects of physical rendering that help to give us realistic images. For the most part, this is understanding material properties and how they interact in the world and with light and so on. Before we start on those details though, I just want to give you a quick run through of the basic, most basic workings of a ray traced renderer. Now let me preface this by saying that this stuff is in no way important to know in any kind of depth or detail, simply for using cameras, lights, materials, setting it all up and getting pretty renders. However, as you go about tweaking all of your bits and pieces and setting up all of the different settings in order to get a good render, it's easy to become lost and not really know what you're doing, or more importantly, why you're doing it a certain way. You can find yourself wondering, why do I need to put this setting a certain way? One of the questions that we all ask ourselves very often, of course, is why can't this work faster? in some situations. It's because of this that a little background on how ray trace rendering works will give you an advantage in understanding all of the settings, the features, and indeed some of the, you know, problems and gotchas that we will encounter along the way, as well as ways that we can then work ourselves around them. So for the most part, a ray trace renderer has one job and one job only in, you know, general terms, and that is to solve this thing here called the rendering equation. Yes, I know I said equation, let's not worry about it. You don't need to know the first thing about solving it, but a renderer does. It's important to at least give this a mention as it's sort of, as far as the renderer itself goes, part of the root of the whole PBR thing in life. Of course, whilst this whole recent push to PBR has been a more recent development, this whole render equation has been around a while. The thing is, it's quite tough to solve, and as a result, for a long time, many renderers, including Lightwave, have employed lots of cheats for various aspects of rendering to try and approximate or simulate the surface rendering that you would get if you were to properly and fully evaluate this. The most common, of course, has been specular, where rather than having soft reflections on things, we just have this sort of specular model that gives us highlights on lights and so on like that, and it becomes glossy or often diffused in the highlight by this fake specular model. Various cheats like this that have been scattered about the place have existed, of course, to speed up rendering so that you can get your final images out in a decent time frame. PBR has many aspects to it, including setting up materials in a PBR fashion, which we'll see. But as far as the renderer goes, it mostly comes down to the fact that we're doing a full scene evaluation in this way and doing it for all the properties, diffuse reflection, specular reflection, refraction, blurring. All of that is being fully ray traced broadly in line with this procedure that we see here. And consequently, since this is how all of our different parameters and surface features are being evaluated and being rendered and, you know, turned into images on our screen, it's beneficial to know what the basic step-by-step -step of the whole rendering process is. Now, having your computer solve one piece of math might sound nice and fantastically simple a thing to do, as of course that's what computers are for. The P in the princess's bedchamber, I'm afraid, is this little fella, an integral. Conceptually, it's pretty simple. It's just the adding up of a lot of stuff. Here's one of the most classical examples of where people use integrals, and that's finding the areas under curves. We should, I hope, doing 3D graphics all have at least some basic familiarity with the idea of finding like the area of a square, right? Height times width, or perhaps the area of a circle, pi times the square of the radius. But when you've got a funny shaped curve like this that doesn't fit, you know, a standard symmetrical or geometric form, how do you measure its area? Well, the most common way is like this. You draw a bunch of blocks underneath the curve, right, which are then just rectangles. Each of their areas is their height times their width, and you just add them all together. The result of adding all those little bits together is the integral. Now, because you're using all of these rectangles, obviously they never perfectly fit the curve, and so you never get the perfect integral. You're getting an approximation to it. Clearly, when you're using very few and very large boxes under your curve, 
then your approximation is quite far from the actual truth. But as you increase the number, you get closer and closer and closer to the true answer. This is convergence. Remember that we saw in the rendering engine the settings for samples, and we said as you turn it up, your render quality gets better. Well, each of these boxes can be thought of as a sample, and as you add more and more samples, you get closer and closer to the actual shape of the curve. You start to converge on the value of the integral. So what is that in this context? Well, it's this, which is a hemisphere. You've got this three-dimensional volume, which is a hemisphere, and you're trying to calculate stuff across the entirety of this hemisphere. What are you trying to calculate? Well, you're trying to calculate all of the light, specifically all of the direct and indirect illumination. So let's say that somewhere in my scene, I've got a sphere, right? And then over here somewhere, I've got a box, something like that. And then up in the sky above them, I've got an area light, let's say. Light that comes from the area light, light that comes from an actual light, we call direct illumination. So where does this hemisphere sit? Well, there are multiple hemispheres. Every single point on the surface of this sphere, and the box as well, and every other object in the scene, has a little hemisphere drawn over it. Or an imaginary hemisphere drawn over it, I should say. What are these points? Well, of course, when you've got an image on screen, each point is a pixel. We sometimes refer to these points as spots, a spot on the mesh. In terms of the image that we see, that is one pixel. And each of those pixels, each of those spots, has its own little hemisphere. For each spot, we measure all of the direct lighting, and direct lighting is lighting that comes from an actual light object. So like an area light or a distant light or what have you. And so for this little spot, you know, the one that's just sort of there, right, I'd be taking all of the direct lighting available in the scene. Now I'm drawing this as a series of lines, but theoretically there's a near infinite number of these. Remember with the curve and we're just, you know, drawing boxes under it like this in order to get the correct number of boxes that fitted the curve perfectly, they'd have to be sliced into infinitely thin slices, right? That's essentially what you're doing here. Next, this area light is also lighting up, you know, other stuff with direct lighting. And then let's assume that we've got global illumination or radiosity. Some of that light is bouncing back off and illuminating our sphere as well. So for every spot, on the surface, we have to figure out the value of every possible light ray from every single direct light and every possible light ray from all of the indirect light. And if we add all of those up together, we know what the shading of this spot should be. That is to say, we know what it looks like. We know its color, we know its brightness, and there you have it. Up here, X, or as we see, you know, noted several times in the equation, x represents a spot on the mesh. We have all of the incoming and outgoing direct and indirect light. We measure all of that across the entire surface of the hemisphere, and we figure out which bits are reflected towards the viewer. It is while we're talking about this point or spot on the scene surfaces that's being evaluated. By this whole rendering method, it's worth having a look at what is actually being evaluated. If you look at some of the other source stuff we've mentioned about PBR materials, PBR rendering, you'll undoubtedly come across references to the BRDF, bidirectional reflectance distribution function, or various forms of it like the BRSDF subsurface and various other little offshoots. Basically, the BRDF is the point in the whole chain where the render settings and the material settings overlap with one another in one of the fundamentally connected ways we mentioned. Basically, what is going on is that we're doing this hemispherical evaluation for each point and spot. We're getting all these rays or samples going out in these different directions from the spot, and each of those picks up lighting, be it direct or indirect. Then each of those incoming light rays that you get from that is served up as an input to the BRDF, 
the function takes it, produces an output, and of course that is the overall value for that spot in terms of its diffuse, its reflectance and everything else. This is why we have sample settings. For each spot, how many samples are we taking? Are we taking just the one sample? If so, then let's say that there's an area of light here. Maybe that sample hits a light or maybe it doesn't and it just carries off forever and hits nothing. If we take two samples, then oh look, one sample hits a light and one sample doesn't and so we get a halfway shade between light and dark. As you take more and more and more and more and more and more samples for each spot, you get a more and more accurate view of what that spot looks like, of what that pixel in the final image looks like. That's why this is actually a hell of an equation. Any one single sample isn't that hard to figure out. It is simply the fact that you have to do a lot of them in order to figure out the image. For instance, let us consider reflections and especially reflection blurring. So here I have a surface, right? And I'm going to evaluate a spot on it. Now, let us say that this surface is pure reflection. That is to say 100% mirror. There's no blurring. The reflections are pin sharp. Well, that's easy. If there's a, an object over here, right? Then the reflection of it is just one ray. That is it. That's all it needs is one sample. However, if we have another surface, which has a blurred reflection, and we want to shade a given spot on it, up here again, let's say we have a box, then we do that by firing out multiple rays in different directions. When each of these rays or each of these samples samples something different in the scene, it will get a bunch of values from each of these places and those values are then just averaged and that becomes the shading of our spot. So we can see this nice and easily here. Here we have what is actually a sphere. Let me just um, show you this. So I've got a sphere here, right? And it's inside a box and each side of the box is colored a different color, okay? It's just got different colors on each side of the box. And so when we see the reflection of that box in the sphere, then we see this, right? Because it's a perfect mirror reflection that we've got. It's pin sharp. Because each side of the box is a block flat color, you know, there's no shading. Every single pixel gets a block flat color. There's no kind of blending or shading of the colors. So let us instead use a blurred reflection like this. And let us note that we are using only one reflection sample here. What do we see? Well, you can see, of course, that each pixel is a single color. Look, we've got the pale green pixels, we've got the pink pixels, we've got the red pixels, the blue pixels, green pixels, black pixels, but we don't have any blended color pixels. Why? Because each pixel is throwing out one sample, therefore it can only possibly hit one point on the box that is surrounding this sphere, and it can only return one color. If we go up to two samples, then look what we start to get. Our colors start to blend a little bit. Why? Because each pixel is now throwing out two samples. One can hit one side of the box, another can hit another side of the box. And so you can see, for instance, along the border here between the pink and the light green, it's picking up this sort of muddy gray color along the middle there. And as we go up to more and more samples, then we start to get more and more blurring of the colors into one another as each spot on the sphere samples multiple colors and blends them together, giving us slightly yellowy orange hues here, little turquoise across there, some purple between the pink and blue and so on. And we see as our sample number gets higher, it gets smoother and cleaner because each pixel is converging on its true value to a greater degree of accuracy. In some situations, this way of working, this, you know, taking a hemisphere at each and every spot and evaluating all of the, you know, incoming and outgoing light from it gives us almost for free in a way, certain photorealistic effects. Again, to stick with reflection, let's imagine that we've got some 
you know, surface here that is reflective. As we say, you know, when it is a perfect mirror reflection, we only have this one line of reflection, this one sample. As it gets blurry, we start to throw rays out, right? But this is the thing, you see, something that is slightly blurry won't actually be using a full hemisphere, it'll be using, you know, a little cone like this for each spot. As you increase the blurriness, then that cone from which it collects samples or sends samples out, whichever way you want to think of it, gets wider and wider. This gives us certain photorealistic effects. Let's just redraw this over here. If we imagine we've got some boxes that are just arranged like this. Here is our reflective surface and it's got a slight blur on it. So a spot is casting out a net, if you will. It's casting out a cone of samples in this sort of a this this sort of an angle samples coming from here are very quickly going to strike this nearby box and the samples that strike the further boxes are going to be more spread out this gives us an effect that we see in the real world when we have slightly roughened reflective surfaces which is that items close to that surface reflect much more crisply and items far away from that surface come out much more blurry. And we can see this here. We just have some blocks on a floor plane and this back polygon there is a reflective polygon with some blurring on its reflection. And we can see as the image starts to resolve here that the nearby block is coming out much more crisp and focused and as we look at the blocks that are progressively further and further away from the surface they are getting blurrier and blurrier. In the real world this is just a consequence of the way that the microsurface of a rough material works and in the renderer it's a consequence of the way in which each spot casts a net of rays in order to sample its environment. And so there we have it. These are the basic workings of our render engine in Lightwave. Why some things work a certain way and others in another. It informs us why we get certain effects in our render and why some effects render more swiftly and others take more time. When all is said and done, you don't need to know the first thing about the rendering equation or the integrals or any of that stuff. As long as you get the basic concept that when you render, each and every pixel is having to collect information about its environment in order to know how it should be shaded and coloured, and thus how it should appear in our final image, as well as the fact that the more information it is able to collect, the more accurately it will be represented in that final image. Then that is the most important thing. And you can see why it is that we have sample settings in the places we have them for the various effects that we have and how turning them up and down gives us our balance between render quality and render speed. Of course as we get further into the training we will go through step by step walkthroughs of how to treat these things in order to get optimized renders so that we can get to the level of quality that we want in ideally the fastest possible time. But for now, that's all we really need to know in regard to the inner working of the render engine. And we'll move on to looking at properties of materials and shading types that help to create realistic looking renders.